I wanted to kind of show some introductory data analytics vis-a-vis -vis Excel uh, to help you get summary statistics a little bit better. But first, so when you're building a dashboard, don't overcomplicate the dashboard, keep it really simple. Um, and uh, just and, and ensure, I think that's the challenge, honestly, I do, is to find the seven most relevant pieces of information when you have 20 or 30. So that could be a challenge in and of itself. Just try to keep it to a minimum. Even with seven visuals, something's gonna get glossed over because the human eye just goes like this, it's really fast. And let's say we're all sitting on the other end of the table, we're not the data scientists or the data analysts, we're just the, 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 the stakeholders, right? And, you know, someone hands us something or puts it up on a, on a slide projector, right? Uh, up, on, uh, up on the board. And we're looking at it. It's like your first instinct is like, what am I looking at, right? There's this dashboard. You're going to gloss over something. It's going to happen. Right? Unless, unless you as a stakeholder are the data scientist as well, or you have experience in this field, and you're one of those nitpicky people that's just going to go, oh, what do they have here for us? Let's see. Oh, there's the bar chart. There's the histogram. Oh, why do they have a line plot when they also have a, uh, a bar chart? Or why do they have a pie chart when they have a bar chart, right? So it's kind of like one of those, it comes down to one of those things is like, you have to decide what you want to put in there. Um, there's a fine line between what's acceptable and okay, now you're overdoing it. You're polluting this entire dashboard with too much information. And when things get clogged up like that, people just go left to right. And it's like, okay, you know what? I, I, yeah, it looks good, but then it's, it's overkill. Um, please, 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 please never, ever, ever do any kind of 3D pie chart or bar chart. That's a classic <sighs> novice mistake, classic. And, and I, I was guilty of that at first too, um, but we all do it at some point or another, even for my company. The funny thing is too, I built out some dashboards for one of my clients and they still, I had to go back and tell them, please don't use the 3D pie chart, please. And they're like, why? I'm like, and I kind of explained the whole angle thing to them. They're like, oh, and it, it, believe me, if it was up to me, if it wasn't an industry standard, I'm, I would much rather prefer the 3D pie chart. It looks neater, right? It looks really cool. It's like, wow, it's 3D. So the angle just distorts it. And there's really no reason for it other than aesthetics. But that's as an industry standard, let me tell you that it's quite unacceptable to have a 3D pie chart. So if somebody as a stakeholder sees that and they have a background in this kind of stuff, they'll be like, oh gosh, 3D pie chart, you know? So um, it's good to know this now, but yeah, it's quite simple. A pie chart will pretty much convey the same information as a bar chart for the most part, right? So the, why have both? So you can pick one that tells the story better. And then in this case, if it's time series, for example, we have months and, and uh, on your x-axis, then perhaps use a line chart, kind of like you see in the stock market. Um, and if it's like linear regression and you are comparing your dependent variable um, y with your independent variable x and it's a scatter plot. So it's up to you to choose what's more relevant. And sometimes in the dashboard, you don't need a graph for everything. A visual could be a table. It could be like a little piece of a pivot table or just a simple table that summarizes your data. Like your summary statistics could be, for example, um, one visual. Like this, for example, could be one of your um, visuals. Don't include anything on there that's not relevant. Like if standard error is not something you wanna convey, just pull it out, delete that row. Keep it simple. And, and it's hard for some people like myself, um, right? Like that's, just, I wanna impress um, my skills onto everybody. But the fact of the matter is sadly, is that they kind of, they're not, they're not impressed. They've seen it all. And sometimes it's a matter of just the simplest thing that gets from point A to B. And that will be actually, funny enough, will be what impresses them. And then, um, one of the, give me one sec. I apologize. One of the data sets I found to be really um, interesting to work with is the Redfin data set for real estate. And what's really cool about this one is like without even plugging in an API or even logging in, you can find the zip code and do analytics on it. So for example, let's say we were to look at Setauket in Long Island. We have all these homes priced differently here. 
on the right hand side on the left hand side we have this map of different real estate prices so if we were to scroll all the way down to the bottom on the right hand side we can download this data set into excel or into a csv file pop it open over here it goes straight to your downloads folder um, you'll have your price which will be your target or dependent variable and let's say you want to actually predict this this price based off of, for example, number of beds, bathrooms, uh, square feet, lot size, perhaps year build, etc. Those would be your independent variables or X. Let's just say you wanted to measure summary statistics, uh, minimum, mean, maximum, median on price, right? You could hypothetically, uh, this is going to be very messy. I'm going to do it right here. Usually what you want to do is create a new sheet. Let's just, let's do that. So let's create a new sheet for price. And then, and one of the things I want to mention here too, is that if you're ever working with the CSV file and you're going to start making changes, especially stylistic or formatting changes to a CSV file, it's not going to take, it's just not going to save. So, uh, it doesn't go into the memory. So what you want to do is actually convert this to an XLSX Excel file. So you would go to save as, um, and then just make sure that it's .xlsx, Excel workbook. But anyway, so you could for price say, for example, the mean is equals mean, and then just highlight everything in price, open close parentheses, press enter, and you have, oops, I forgot in Excel, it's actually average, my, my apologies. So average, change that to average, and you have your average. You can go ahead and do the same thing, get your median, I'm just changing the function that's your median and so on and so forth right but that's kind of a pain right don't you think to just sit there and write one um function at a time what what's really cool about excel is first you have to have the data analysis tool pack installed for this and you would find this in your data ribbon up top and over on the right hand side you have what's called data analysis right here the if you don't have that you can get it by going to file options and um, add-ins over on the bottom on the left hand side and then uh, on the right hand side you'll see analysis tool pack what you want to do is select that um, and where it says manage excel add-ins click on go and just ensure that this analysis tool pack uh, checkbox is checked off and then click ok and that should give you the data analysis tool pack on the right hand side. You will need this to build linear regression models. So to get these summary statistics, you would just simply click data analysis and select uh, the analysis tool that is required from the list. And that would be descriptive statistics because when we're looking for summary statistics, we're doing descriptive statistics. You select that and click OK, and then select your input range. What's really cool about the data analysis tool pack is that it gives you this, it pretty much gives you everything you need in, in a nice little um, pop-up box or dialog box. And all you have to do is just fill out the form. So your input range, simple, there's only one range. It's everything that's in column A, so you select that. Um, all the way down from A2, all the way down to the bottom. I love to use shortcuts. So one way to do that, or how I would do that is uh, select cell A2, uh, and then while um, on cell A2, go control shift down, and that selects everything all the way down to the bottom for you. And as we can see, there's only 70 rows of data. I wanna mention that um, you want to have a robust data set um, in order for us to have a nice, normal, bell-shaped curve. We need to have at least n equals 30 observations at a minimum. So for the central limit theorem to work, you want to select a data set that basically has at least 30 observations or 30 rows. If you have, in this case, 70, I mean, is it really realistic? We're looking at a real estate data set to have 70 homes. So in this particular zip code, Setauket, or what we're looking at specifically, I think we drilled down to East Setauket. As it stands now, there are only 70 homes. That being said, 
if you're using a uh, repository, a free one, especially like Redfin, then e there is a bit of a, a limitation on what you can download. And I think it gives you a maximum, I would have to check the documentation of about 270 rows. So let's say your data set has 350 homes in that zip code you're looking at. Well, Redfin's only gonna give you, let's say 270. So th that's one of the limitations of Redfin. So be mindful of that. And if you're going to have a selection of less than what your zip code actually holds, then label that as your sample size. So you're not dealing with the entire population. That is your sample size. And based on your limitation, this is what the sample size was selected for you to be. That was the sampling that the Redfin chose for you. So as long as you provide justification uh, and understand the limitations that you're facing or dealing with, then you have all, all the reason to move forward in your project. So then I'm in, you know, basically this is it. We open the dialog box, we select our range and um, automatically your output will go into a new worksheet. And then um, we're looking again for summary statistics. So we wanna check off that box. We're not dealing with confidence levels right now or anything else. So we'll just go ahead and click okay. And um, surely enough on a new worksheet, we have our descriptive statistics or summary statistics. And that is, and those are our mean, uh, median, we even have standard deviation here. We don't have, um, yeah, no, we have all that. So it's all here. Now, the reason this says column one by default is because as a matter of fact, if we were to go back and redo this, this is the importance of labels in the data analysis tool back. If we were to redo this, we go back to data, data analysis, descriptive statistics, same process again, only this time instead of or selecting from A2, we will select right from the top, right where that label price is, which is in cell A1. This is why we label our first row, our header row, because look at what happens. We click OK. Oh, and then it says import range contains non-numeric data. Well, that's because I didn't specify this very important checkbox here where it says labels in first row. So we'll click OK. And now, surely enough, we have this labeled as price. So it's a, it's a fairly straightforward tool. It's, it's, you know, I would say it's easy to use because it does the work for you, essentially. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you. Um, and, you'll, and you'll find this a lot, especially if you want to work with the data set that uh, pertains to your current job. There's a lot of sensitive information in there. And as I'm sure you'll, you'll know and you're, or you're, you'll find is that you'll be very much limited in terms of access. And, and that's fine, I understand that. Uh, no need to explain, thank you for sharing. So the student asked me, um, is it okay if I simulate a data set? My answer is yes. Is it okay if I found this repository on GitHub, can I use something similar? My answer is yes. Um, can I make up certain um, ranges or, or values? My answer is yes, but, please don't get in the habit of making up data sets unless you're just doing testing later. Um, if you need to test uh, models to see if they work or functions to see if they work, you can create an empty, you can create a data frame uh, and, and put some you know, fake values in there, that's fine. As a matter of fact, I think I, I can go back in Excel just for a second and show you something cool you can do. So let me go ahead and reshare my screen. So one quick way to create a, a data set it, in Excel would be to, um, let's say, I don't know, you're working with some quantity of a product that's being manufactured, right? And you know that that product, uh, that, that product's output in whatever time frame you're working with in, in that range um, in month one or quarter one cannot exceed I don't know, 100 units of widgets. I can't think of anything better. So you would say, I know that this product would be one to 100, right? There, there can only be one unit of this product up to, but not exceeding 100. So you could do something like rand equals rand for random. And the standard random function, if you just do this, rand open close parentheses, 
will just give you any random value. So every time you click into that cell or run that again, it gives you a new random value, which is really cool, right? Like, and if you, um, I don't know, let's call this uh, product uh, or units, I don't know. This doesn't make sense. What, what are we dealing with here? Percentages, right? Like that doesn't make sense in terms of product units. And then here uh, we can say, what could this be? You can say like, um, for example, month, right? Month's not gonna change. We have January, February, and so on and so forth. So we'll select the first two and then go all the way down to uh, December. And um, let's say, we'll call this instead of units, we'll say this would be our, let's move this over to the right-hand side. And let's say this is our uh, percentage of, I don't know, percent complete, or I, I don't know what we're working with here. Some kind of manufacturing process for any given industry. And here we'll say units, right? We'll keep this short, right? So we don't have a lot to work with uh, by way of KPIs. Hard to define, there's only three columns, right? We haven't defined them yet. We haven't figured out what they are. And for percent complete, um, if you're not basing, this is just ob strictly observational data, you can use just a rand function. It's gonna give you a bunch of random values here in terms of percentages. But in terms of units, if you know that your output for that product is, um, one to 100 in any given month, you can use uh, a function in that same family, which is called rand between. And it literally says what it means. It's random values between, and then you specify open parentheses, let's say your bottom in uh, your first argument is one, because we know we can have a lower limit of one product, comma top, your upper limit, which would be 100. So rand between one to 100 gives you any value, random, any random value in that range. So if we bring this down, uh, you have yourself, a, well, a fake data frame pretty much. But once you have that, the important thing is to lock this in, because if you don't, it's just going to keep every time you go through the page or, you know, go back and forth, it's going to change. It's going to change on you because that's the whole it's a stochastic process pretty much. It's randomized. So it's going to keep changing on you. So what you want to do is just select everything here and repaste this as values. So, so highlight everything here and uh, paste as values like so. So now it doesn't have formulas in it. So that's one way to create um, a data frame. What I'm saying here is by creating this empty data frame is if you were to do nothing else, if you had no data, at the very least, you know, do something like this.